Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to Korea Economic Institute today. We have a, a fantastic program today, and I don't want to take up too, of it, too much of your time, but I wanted to just start off by uh, doing a little bit of advertisement for uh, KEI. Right in front of you, you have a, a book, a purple cover, and that is our uh, 2012 Korea's Economy. Uh, as many of you know, uh, each year we produce uh, this volume and we were a little bit delayed this year, but uh, certainly uh, uh, we, it's hot off the press and we were very thrilled to produce uh, this book. And as you will see, there are many leading economic and, and political eco economic scholars that have uh, contributed to our volume this year. So you are the first recipients of this book. So uh, we, we encourage you to take it back with you and, and, and read it. So uh, with that, also, uh, I also want to welcome you to today's program. This is a very important program. It's part of our Korea Compass series. And as many of you know and have uh, participated in our previous events, this is an opportunity, uh, a series that we focus on Korea's growing global role um, in, in many different arenas, not only in uh, different regions of the world, but also in areas of uh, transnational issues such as international development as well as uh, non-proliferation and in other areas and we're really thrilled to have uh, Dr. Cha with us today from KDI. Um, <clears throat> as you know, doc, uh, the Korea uh, knowledge sharing uh, program is a, a tremendous program where Korea has the opportunity to share its development story, its development uh, 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 patterns and, and various lessons learned with other developing uh, countries uh, around the world. And Dr. Chow is sharing with us some of the experience he has as he's talking with uh, these representatives from uh, developing parts of the world, learning how Korea achieved its economic miracle. And in some cases, um, uh, they've, they were very moved by Korea's own experience and the hope and opportunity that these developing countries have to also follow a uh, similar kind of develop, uh, development path uh, into the future. So we're looking forward to a great program today, and I want to turn over to our moderator for today, uh, Sarah Yoon, our, our very own uh, Director of Regional Affairs, uh, and she'll introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Kim. My name is Sarah Yoon with the Korea Economic Institute, and I'm the Director of Public Affairs and Regional Issues here. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to, this is the fifth installment of the Korea Compass Series, which um, Dr. Kim explained, uh, looking at Korea's footprints and engagements around the world, especially focused on developing countries and regions. Uh, and today, we have the honor of having um, Dr. Cha Moon Jung of the Korea Development Institute with us uh, to speak on Korea's knowledge sharing program and Korea's participation in international development cooperation. Uh, so as you know, uh, the, Korea uh, Korea, uh, the knowledge sharing program, uh, short for um, KSP, is a model for um, Korea's involvement uh, in international development around the world. And so I look forward to learning a lot about it today. Um, so before starting the presentation, I will uh, briefly introduce our, our speaker for today. Um, Dr. Moon Jung Cha is currently a senior research fellow and the executive director of the Center for International Development at the Korea Development Institute. And prior to this position, he was uh, the vice president and director for the Department of Industrial and Corporate Affairs at KDI, as well as the director for the Office uh, of Economic Development Cooperation at KDI. Previously, he um, taught at the University of Western, uh, at the University of Western Australia, and the University of New South Wales. Uh, and he has also served as a visiting fellow at the KDI School, Seoul National University, and the Australian National University. Um, he's an ec economist, an academic, a practitioner, as well as an author. And um, he has authored and edited many books and papers. And um, some of the examples are uh, the International Forum on the Service Sector Advancement and the current status and overview of the development cooperation of Korea. And I believe there, if you want to read, read up on them, they're accessible online, maybe on the KDI website. So I encourage you to do so. 
Um, and on the topic of the paper, we have Dr. Cha's paper in front of you. Um, it's, it has a Korea Compass <coughs> banner, and it, it explains the Korea, um, Korea's knowledge sharing program in, uh, in uh, deep uh, detail. So I encourage you to take a look at it. You have the car hard copy in front of you, as well as we have the soft copy on our website. So with that, uh, I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Cha. Good afternoon. My name is Moon Jung Cha. Well, uh, thank you for uh, very kind introduction of myself to you, uh, Sarah. And I really appreciate the, to have this opportunity to you know, discuss about the knowledge sharing program with you today. And I appreciate the KAI you know, to provide me such a wonderful opportunity uh, to present knowledge sharing program here. Well, this presentation was actually prepared with my colleague, Yulang Kim. And she cannot uh, join me to come here, but um, I, I, I think that the knowledge sharing program is quite successful in many aspects. However, it is never perfect, and as well as presenting the knowledge sharing program to you today, I would like to get your advice because you know it has to be improved, it has to be evolved, and it, it has to be more effective. Uh, for our partner countries, development partner countries. So I was told that I'm allowed only 30 or 40 minutes for my presentation. So I'll try to be very brief. The only problem is some of my uh, PowerPoint, the point of my PowerPoint is not that large. I thought that you would have the, the copy, hard copy of my, uh, my presentation, uh, but I found that actually you don't. So well, I'm really sorry about that. I had to prepare my font a little bit larger. But let me try to explain thoroughly, if need be. Right. Yep, today's presentation consists of this six part from the Korea ODA and knowledge for development. And then why the knowledge sharing of Korea is quite popular among many developing countries. And then I'll concentrate on one of KSP, that is bilateral policy consultation, and briefly introduce some other kinds of a KSP that are currently pursued by the Korean government, and then I'll conclude my presentation. But I'll start with the Korea's ODA. Probably you, some of you may have a better idea about Korea's ODA, but let me give you just a, a wide picture of Korea's ODA. Well, Korea is a kind of an infant in the world of ODA. In 2010, this is official figure, Korea's total ODA reached about $1.2 billion. And you know, as you know very well, we can categorize them in bilateral and multilateral. In bilateral, we have about $900 million, that is 77% of total ODA of Korea. And the multilateral is far smaller than bilateral in 23%. It's about $270 million. If you look at bilateral, you know, if we categorize them again in grant and loan, the grant explain about 64% of total bilateral ODA. And loan explain about 36%. So grant is better, but compared to other developed countries, still the share of loan is quite large. This is one characteristic of Korea's ODA. And if you look at multilateral, the 64% of multilateral ODA concentrate on MDBs, multilateral development bank, like the World Bank, and ADB, IDB, and AFDBs. And then uh, contribution to UN, explain about UN and some other international organizations, explain about 36%. So as you can see, the total 1.2 billion dollars, it's not that big, really. And if you look at the, some other statistics, you can find that you know, Korea is in its infant stage you know, very easily. Very small font, I'm sorry about that. Korea is here in terms of GNI among OECD countries. Korea is ranked as number 10 
So in terms of GNI among OECD countries in 2011, it's quite large. However, the total amount of ODA is only the 17th. The total amount is $1.3 billion, explaining that in one year time from 2010 to 2011, the total amount of ODA increased by about $0.2 billion. That's very fast, actually. However, still the ODA GNI ratio is very low. The ODA GNI ratio is 0.12. That is far below than the average of uh, dark member countries, and the rank is 26. Unfortunately, the total number of member countries of dark is 26. So Korea has the lowest ODA GNI ratio. Right here you have uh, some more statistics for other DAC member countries and non-DAC member countries, but always member countries, like this. And if we summarize them in one figure, in the x-axis we have ODA GNI ratio, and y-axis we have total amount of ODA, then Korea is the right below. You, know, you can find that in terms of ODA GNI ratio, it is the smallest, and in terms of total amount of ODA, it is not the smallest, but uh, very small, actually. It is very similar to Greece, Portugal, and Finland, so small-scale countries. And one interesting thing here is that you know, United States is quite an outlier here. You know, the ODA GNI ratio is not very large. However, the total amount of ODA is extremely large. So except the United States, if you look at other countries with a relatively high amount of ODA, they are Germany, Japan, United Kingdom, France. And most, most of these countries you know, declare that one of the most important purpose of their ODA is to strengthen the economic tie with the rest of the world. So usually the countries with the relatively large size, they donate quite a large amount of money, though the ODA GNI ratio is not that large, and most of these countries pursue the strong economic tie with the developing countries. So the movement of Korea, we expect that will be very fastly in this way. So the Korean government aims to reach about 0.25% of ODA GNI ratio in three years' time. So 0.25% of uh, you know, ODA GNI ratio means that in total, uh, the ODA amount will be about $3 billion. So that will be about here in three years' time. It's quite ambitious, in fact, because uh, it means that in every year, Korea has to increase its ODA by, how much is it? Samcheon uh, or won means uh, about uh, $300 million. But if we consider the, the budget needs in Korea, you know, there are many, budget, many kinds of different budget needs like uh, the social welfare, economy, education, and even the preparation for reunification. It is not that easy to increase the ODA budget for $300 million every year, for three years or four years in a row. So that is quite ambitious for the Korean government. And now we can move, oh, well, one more slide for Korea's ODA. There is very strong critique about Korea's ODA because you know, Korea's ODA is fragmented. It means that in Korea, many different organizations are implementing ODA. But if we calculate fragmentation index for for dark member countries, we can find that uh, Korea is not bad, actually. So for countries like the Netherlands, Denmark, Australia, Luxembourg, Ireland, New Zealand, the fragmentation index is zero. It means that just one or two implementing department or organizations carry out the whole amount of ODA. If it is 10%, it means that uh, some other organizations or department, non-major you know, organiza organizations or department carry out about 10% of ODA every year. So in case of Norway, Sweden, Finland, it's less than 10%. It means that just major department or organizations implement ODA. In case of Korea, it is slight, slightly less than 20%. 
together with England, Japan, and Switzerland. So if you look at you know, the countries with 0% of FI and less than 10% of FI, they are actually very small countries, except the Netherlands or Sweden, and they are all the northern European countries, except New Zealand. So other than this country, if we compare Korea to uh, the major donors in ODA world, actually the fragmentation is not that bad in case of Korea. It means that the uh, two major players, COICA and EDCF, uh, implemented about 80% of Korea's uh, ODA. Right, let's move to the next topic that is about knowledge for development. Let me start with the recent debate about development assistance. Uh, some leading scholars like Jeffrey Sachs or William Misterly once said that the economic development in the destination country, recipient country, must be the most important factor of economic development, for the, the factor to, to save that country from poverty. So Jeffrey Sachs said that, uh, you know, to help them to ascend up the ladder of economic development will end the poverty. And also the William Misterly said that the homegrown development based on the dynamism of individuals and firms must play the major role in ending the poverty. So it means that nowadays they are more and more think about the development mechanism in the destination country, recipient country. And actually there was kind of aid fatigue in many donor countries in the 1990s. It means that many donor countries pour the large amount of money into developing countries. However, it was very difficult for them to find any symptom of economic development in these developing countries. So they are thinking about you know, how to improve the effectiveness of their development cooperation, and they thought that knowledge must be the one of the most important factors of economic development. So before 1990, you know, even when the donor countries help developing countries, they just try to transfer money, cash or in kind. However, they did not transfer knowledge at the proper level. So they decided that to incorporate knowledge into their development cooperation because they thought that this is the best way to enhance development effectiveness. And also, you know, many international organizations predict that in the future, the knowledge sharing must be the most important part of economic growth and sustainable development, not just for developing countries, but for developed countries as well. So if you think that in the future, the knowledge plays more and more important role for economic growth and sustainable development, then the developed countries must share knowledge one another, and at the same time, they create new knowledge and transfer that on for, to the developing countries. So in 1996, OECD found that more than half of more than half of the GDP of the major OECD economies is from the knowledge-based economy. So knowledge is becoming more and more important, and this knowledge is embodied in human beings or in technology, and the developed countries must share this knowledge with developing countries for sustainable development. This is the whole logic, you know, why the knowledge sharing is becoming more and more important. So in 1998, the World Bank declared that it is knowledge bank. It is not the money bank anymore. It is knowledge bank. And this year, I found, I found that the World Bank changed its catchphrase again to solution bank. So not only providing knowledge to developing countries, they said that they would like to find the solutions for developing countries for sustainable economic development. And you know, not only the World Bank, but also some regional development bank like ADB also declare that uh, the ADB is knowledge broker of the region. You know, knowledge broker, you know, as you know, means that uh, they create some knowledge or collect knowledge and then disseminate this knowledge to developing countries in the region. And OECD also emphasized that the whole world is moving into a knowledge-based economy. And OECD also initiate a knowledge sharing alliance or knowledge sharing platform nowadays. So knowledge is important. And what about Korea? In strategic plan for international development cooperation announced in 2010, 
the Korean government announced that Korea should utilize its unique development experience to make meaningful contributions to the international community. Based on this idea, the Korea strongly suggests that the knowledge sharing must be included in one of the nine pillars of development in G20 Seoul Development Consensus, and also the HLF4, which was hosted in Korea last year in Busan, declared that knowledge sharing is one of the most important part of development cooperation. And also 2004, the Korean government started knowledge sharing program. And from now on, my presentation will focus on this knowledge sharing program. This is the basic idea of a knowledge sharing program of Korea. We believe that in many developing countries, policymakers and practitioners, they need practical and relevant knowledge that you know, they can use to make their country developed. So they need some kind of policy-oriented research, not the scholarly research. And from Korea's point of view, you know, Korea accumulated a huge amount of experience, development experience in the last 50 years. And this knowledge now must be mobilized and shared with other economies. It means that we have to uncage our knowledge. So there is demand side you know, from developing countries to use the knowledge accumulated and created by Korea. And there is supply side from Korea that you know, we achieved a very rapid economic development. And throughout that uh, development era, we accumulated the experience and knowledge. And we have to share this one with the rest of the world. Well, here, let me use you know, what uh, Professor Robert Lucas said about uh, Korea. You know, in his paper, in Making a Miracle, published in Econometrica in 1993, he said that the case of Korea is like just a miracle. He said that never before have the lives of so many people undergone so rapid an improvement over so long a period. And nor is there any sign that this progress is near its end. Probably he was right at the time, but you know, nowadays we can find that there is a lot of sign that this progress is almost its end. However, in 1993, Korea still achieved about 8 or 9% of annual growth. And there is no sign of ending this kind of you know, rapid economic development. Here, so many people indicated more than, three mil more than 30 million people in the early 1960s undergone so rapid an improvement, means that about 8 or 9% of annual economic growth over so long a period explained more than 30 years of time. So in the human being's history, it is really rare to find this kind of case that more, for more than 30 years, one country experienced you know, higher than 8 or 9% of annual growth on average. And Professor Ann Kruger of SAIS, and a former vice, vice president of IMF, I think, she said that the Korea's policy conversion toward outward looking is the most dramatic and dynamic policy. So here we can find that Korea achieved miraculous economic growth. And actually, the policy played a very important role. So we believe that you know, policy must be the very important for other developing countries for economic growth. Here, you know, I showed you a very brief figure of the growth of per capita GDP of Korea from 1945 to uh, 2010. As you know, the Korea was liberated from Japan, the illegal occupation by Japan for 36 years in 1945. In 1953, when Korean War was over, the per capita GDP was only $67. In 1961, when Korea experienced military coup, the per capita GDP was $82. And in 1962, when Korea started the first five-year economic development plan, the per capita GDP was only $87. But in 2007, its per capita GDP broke through $20,000. And even after then, Korea recorded positive economic growth. However, because of the change in exchange rate, in terms of the US dollar, the per capita GDP of Korea decreased slightly. And we expect uh, about $23,000 of per capita GDP uh, this year. 
And from this figure, we can find that you know, Korea's economic growth is not uh, running on the smooth road always. And if you look at some other you know, aspect of this country, actually, the Korea's experience is very similar to many other developing countries. It was colony once, and it experienced war until 1953. In 1960, it experienced the civilian revolution, 61, military coup, 79, another military coup, 87, another civilian revolution. So the country experienced a lot of revolutions, coup, and oil crisis. However, it always tried to overcome this kind of crisis very wisely. So this is why many developing countries feel some kind of affinity with Korea. Then, you know, what kind of factors really contribute to economic growth of Korea? I think this is really important because this is what many developing countries are really interested in. Not only for Korea, but if you look at some highly, sorry, this is wrong, highly performed Asian economies, it must be HPAE, highly performed Asian economies, like Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong, all of these economies have these four very important characteristics. The first one is very high rate of domestic saving and high growth rate of physical capital. So as you know, you know capital is one of the most important factor of economic growth. And then second one is human capital, higher initial levels of human capital and growth rate of human capital. In case of Korea, one year right after the end of the Korean War in 1954, the Korean government declared the first six-year human resource development plan. In that plan, the Korean government said that it would achieve universal primary education in six years, in 1960. However, the Korean government achieved that goal in only four years' time. So in 1958, virtually all the young children in Korea got primary education. So Korea could accumulate human capital very rapidly because in the 1950s, there was a universal primary education. And in the 1960s, the focus was moving to the secondary school. And 1970s reinforced the focus on secondary school, especially engineering and vocational school. And in, 19, in, and in the 1980s, the government emphasized university education, and the country moved into more knowledge-based economy since the 1990s. So there was really good match between education and economic growth. And proper government intervention, while some people may not like this idea because sometimes government intervene into market too much. However, in general, the government tried to respect the private sector and we can overall we can say that the government intervention was in general proper and also in case of korea and some asian countries they could control fertility rate very well very successfully in the early stage of economic development and if you look at all of these factors actually you can find that the institution and the policy played very important roles and many developing countries are interested in you know, what kind of institutions and what kind of policies they can use to achieve this kind of uh, you know, bottom factors of economic growth and then finally achieve uh, the economic growth phenomenon in the right hand side. Just for your interest, this is the picture of Korean, young, you know, Korean children drinking aid milk in one village yard in 1954, just after the Korean War. It was originally black and white photo, but due to the modern technology, we can use you know, computer and have a colorful photo here. About this time in 1954, 1955, uh, the USAID explained about 10% of, Korea's, no, about of Korea's GDP. About 10% of Korea's GDP explained about 30 or 40% of Korea's government budget. So in, 19, in the 1950s, Korea could not survive without the aid from foreign countries. But nowadays, Korea became one of the you know, advanced countries. So Korea may play a very important role bridging the two world developed and developing countries. 
I'm not sure whether you have seen this photo before. This is Cheonggyecheon stream in Seoul. Cheonggyecheon is a very small stream running through the heart of central business district of Seoul. And that Cheonggyecheon stream just looked like this in the 1950s and 1960s. The water was so dirty, polluted. So in 1964, the government decided to cover this river stream with concrete. And then we had road and some stores and some residential areas on that the concrete. But in 2004, 2005, government reconstructed this area and they changed it like that. So this is kind of you know, a dream for many developing countries. So you can say that this is from poverty to prosperity. And Korea could produce probably potato chips in the 1960s. However, nowadays, they can produce <laughs> computer chips. So in such a short time, the industrial structure changed a lot. And in the 1950s and 60s, you could see these kind of young kids on the street very frequently. And the country moved from this despair to hope in 1.5 generations. They are young idol groups of Korea. And one important thing is that most of them look alike, right? <laughs> it seems like that they are manufactured from some places. And actually, one of them is my niece. <laughs> as well as you know, the, this kind of economic growth of you know, 8 or 9% of annual growth, uh, Korea also achieved qualitative achievement during the 1960s and 1970s. So if you look at Gini coefficient, as you know very well, the lower, the better. In case of Korea, Korea's per capita GDP growth rate from 1965 to 1990 was one of the lowest. However, it's one of the highest. However, its Gini coefficient is one of the lowest. So Korea recorded the highest economic growth and the lowest Gini coefficient, means that Korea achieved very equal income distribution around this time. So as well as quantitative growth, Korea also achieved qualitative uh, achievement. So in 1993, World Bank officially announced that Korea achieved very rapid and shared economic growth. It's right, you know, in 1961, it was $82 per capita GDP. That was about $22,000 in 2007. And it is one of a few countries which transformed from aid recipient to donor country successfully. And now it is trying to bridge the developing and developed world. And as one of the efforts, the Korean government started knowledge sharing program in 2004. And you know, I will explain more about KSP soon, but anyway, in brief, until this year, 2012, cumulatively, Korea had this KSP with 107 countries for more than 440 policy topics. Now what is KSP? KSP is financed by Ministry of Strategy and Finance of Korea. And it has three things here, policy consultation, joint consulting with MDBs, and modularization. This policy consultation is implemented by Center for International Development of KDI. And modularization is implemented by KDI School, KDI School of Public Policy by KDI and joint consulting with MDBs. This is kind of a KSP that Korea Axim Bank is working together with multilateral development bank for developing countries. So we have three portfolios, and among these three, KDI is implementing the policy consultation and modularization. If we concentrate on bilateral policy consulting, this KSP is designed to assist develop partner countries in key policy areas by sharing Korea's development knowledge and experience. From the first time in 2004, it has three characteristics. The first one is demand-driven, the second one is policy-oriented, and third one is comprehensive. Demand-driven means that we do not enforce or suggest our partner countries to concentrate on certain topics. We respect their ownership, and whenever they want to do something, we try to help them. In that sense, this is demand-driven. So some people criticize that this is Korea's standard planting. 
they criticize that KSB means Korean standard planting, but that is not true because we do not have a Korean standard. We just respect the foreign countries, developing countries' ownership. And when they are interested in something, we are working together to get solution for them. And as, we, as I told you before, the aim of this one is not to write a scholarly paper for top journals. This is policy-oriented one, so this is more practical. And this is comprehensive because it has many items. For example, it includes workshop, it includes collaborative research, field work, and then high-level dialogue and capacity building. So this is comprehensive in the sense. Then what kind of topics does KSB cover? Very wide range of topics, especially in economic development and social development. Topics include economic development strategy, industrialization and export promotion, knowledge-based economy, economic crisis management, and human resource development. One good thing of the Korea's experience is that it made a lot of mistakes, and it experienced a lot of trial and error. So we had a lot of examples to show developing countries that you know, we made this kind of mistake. If you want to avoid this one, then we would like suggest you to in this way, like that. In the sense, you know, Korea's experience is very colorful. And virtually all the issues suggested by development partner countries are considered. But sometimes it is beyond our ability. And in, in the case, we very frankly confess that we don't know it very well. And if at all possible, we try to ask some international organizations or developed countries who have some knowledge about uh, that topic. In the future, probably not only economics and social development, but cultural aspect should be the one very important part of KSP. So as you know very well, Sai or Mr. Kim gi the director of the film who got the best film award in both the Cannes and Berlin uh, Film Festival. So we are accumulating a lot of experience in our culture and, and sports as well. And in the future, probably this one can be one very important item of KSP. If you look at budget and part number of partner countries, they increased very fast. So even faster than the economic growth of Korea in the 1960s and 1970s. So it started with only one, one billion won, Korean currency, one billion won in 2004. And 2011, it becomes 140 billion won. And 2012, 170 billion won. And number of countries started with two in 2004, became 26 last year, and became 33 this year. So you can find that uh, this is a knowledge intensive job. However, this is not capital intensive. You can find that only four or five billion won is used for one country's KSP. So this is very cost efficient. For development partner countries, usually we have one year of duration. And for strategic development partner countries, we have two years of duration plus one more year if our partner countries show their interest to continue this project, this program. So we started with collaborative research and we are hosting workshop together with the, the expert in our partner countries. And we are going field trip together, we are hosting seminars together, and we provide a policy consulting report at the end of this whole cycle. Uh, I'll just show you one or two examples of KSP. Well, this gentleman is President Fernandez of Dominican Republic. I think he stepped down uh, just recently. But while he was in president, he said that he would like to make the Dominican Republic the Korea of the Caribbean. And actually, this country, Dominican Republic, has been uh, the development partner country of Korea from 2008. And you know, a lot of institutions and policies are shared with this country. And Dominican Republic now is equipped with uh, a lot of uh, facilities and institutions to encourage its export and increase the efficiency of the government. 
And another example is Saudi Arabia. As you know, the Saudi Arabia is not a developing country. Its per capita GDP reached about $18,000 in 2010. That is almost the same as Korea. But Saudi Arabia was interested in KSP with Korea. So in 2010, we were working together for economic development plans for Saudi Arabia and how to improve efficiency of primary education and what kind of smart grid can be applied to Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia was very much interested in KSP. So in 2011, we had another KSP round with Saudi Arabia. And from the suggestion from our previous work in 2010, especially about primary education, we started to work together to build up education broadcasting system in Saudi Arabia. And it is still going on in 2012. And in 2012, the e-learning solution is now provided for Saudi Arabia. And we are also working together to build up Saudi Development Institute, like a KDI in Saudi Arabia. And here I have some examples of KSP in 2011. In 2011, we had 26 partner countries. And the major theme of collaborative research reached about 105. So Saudi Arabia, Myanmar, Dominican Republic, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Bolivia. So these countries are from Asia, MENA area, Africa, and, and Latin America, and also from Eastern European countries. So in 2012, we have 33 countries all together. And the total number of topics is more than 140, of 128, I'm sorry. And we have a modularization as another portfolio of KSP. A modularization is uh, to convert Korea's development experience into knowledge. So we had experience, however, they are not very systematically documentized. And you know, they are not transformed into a database. So in 2010, we tried a 20 modularization you know, based on Korea's economic development experience and they were very successfully completed by KDI. In 2011, we passed it to KDI School, and KDI School also completed 40 modularization on the Korea's development experience. And then this year, actually this is the last year of the phase one of this modularization, the KDI School is supposed to finish another 40 modularization. So by the end of this year, we are having 100 policy examples of Korea that is newly created knowledge based on our experience. And then when we are doing KSP bilateral consulting in the future, we can use these Korea's examples as kind of you know, text. And then we will see how to modify this one for our development partner countries. And the field covers administration, ICT, agriculture, health and medication, to environment. Virtually, you know, all the field covered by government policies. And we have another one uh, by Korea Axim Bank, that is KSP with MDBs. It started from 2010. And so far, the, M the, the Axim Bank has been working with MDBs like ADB, IDB, World Bank, and APCICT. Okay, so if we summarize the features of KD KSP, then we can say like this. The first of all, KSP is official cooperation between governments or countries. This is not for profit. So we try to exclude the participation of a private sector in the first stage. In a second or third stage, after we finish our policy consulting, if it is required that the you know, private sector must come into this project to increase the inefficiency, increase the efficiency and effectiveness of this project, then probably we can we can invite private sector. But initially, this is official cooperation, not for not for profit. And KSP is very widely open. It is widely open, meaning that. The researchers, the scholars, and relevant ministries can join this project if they have specialties. And outcomes of modularization and consultations are uploaded in the website homepage. And anyone who want to use this one can have free access to uh, this output. 
And KSP is not transferring cash or in-kind things. This is just a sharing the knowledge. And the, the development partner countries are not limited to ODA recipients. Actually, any country who is interested in sharing knowledge can join this program. So some countries like uh, Romania and Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, or Brazil, Mexico, Republic of South Africa, they are all the member countries of this KSP. And KSP is based on Korea's comparative advantage, it means that Korea enters the, the stage of advanced economy. However, it is still poor compared to some developed countries like the United States. So the Korea's comparative advantage is not in the capital. It is in the Korea's very lively experience of economic development. So it follows the adva comparative advantage of Korea. And it respects the ownership of our partner countries fully. And we also emphasize capacity building for partner countries because even after the project is over and we are not working for that country anymore, still that country must be able to operate the system or institution for itself. So this is why the capacity building is regarded as one of the most important part of KSP. And we need passion for all of this kind of work. <laughs> and where are we now in 2012? Well, KSP is never perfect. And we are working really hard to make KSP more effective and efficient and demander friendly. So first of all, we fully recognize that we have to enhance the quality of our research content. So when you create knowledge like a modularization, the quality must be guaranteed. And when you select our partner countries, we have to use more scientific method. And the whole operation management of the procedure must be more systematic. And then quality of a policy consultation must be enhanced as well. And the KSP itself is not ODA, frankly speaking, because you know, we are working with many non-ODA countries, non-recipient countries. However, after we finish the first stage of our work, KSP, we can link or coordinate with other ODA in Korea, like COICA or EDCF, so you know, they can start their work in our uh, development partner countries. And still the monitoring and evaluation is in its infant stage. So we are working really hard to work with the World Bank or OECD to improve our evaluation scheme and try to more actively participate in, in a global knowledge sharing activities. And we try to create more components of KSP. One of the examples is why KSPNs, that is young KSPNs, and we recruited young people from the university or graduate school and invite them to join our KSP from the first stage to the final stage. So they make a trip together with us, expert in Korea and our partner countries. They joined all the workshops and seminars, and we hope them to grow up as next generation's leader of international development cooperation. Right, I think the knowledge is really important. This is the a photo of Korean Peninsula at night time from the satellite. And you can find that the southern part of Peninsula is very light. However, the northern part is just dark. You know, we have the same race, same people, same language, and same history, same culture. However, because of different paradigm, a different usage of knowledge, these two countries showed completely different paths of economic development. So we always think that the knowledge is really important for economic growth, and we are ready to share our knowledge with many developing countries. And as I told you, you know, the, frankly speaking, KSP must be improved a lot. And uh, I really appreciate if you have any comments or suggestions to improve the quality of KSP. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Cha, for that very uh, highly informative presentation. Um, it was very informative and thorough, and I personally learned a lot about 
uh, the Korea um, Knowledge Sharing Program. So at this time, uh, we would love to open up the floor for questions or comments. Um, like Dr. Cha said, if you have any comments or feedback on um, the, the Knowledge Sharing Program itself, um, we would welcome that too. So uh, perhaps while you're thinking of questions, I'll uh, ask the first question and then I'll, we'll open it up to the floor. Um, so, Dr. Chai, you mentioned that this is uh, KSP is a, is an official cooperation between governments. So, governments is plural, uh, and obviously, I've seen a, a bilateral um, exchange. But have you considered you know, trilateral exchange or uh, opening up to beyond bilateral exchange? For example, we're in Washington D.C. So, um, is there a way for the U.S. to participate, um, given that the U.S. has a strong alliance with Korea? So am I supposed to answer to your question right now? Sure, or? and then okay. we'll have um, you know give some time for the audience to come up with questions. Right. Um, well, as I told you, we have uh, three kinds of different KSP. That is bilateral consulting and modularization and working with MDBs currently. And we are thinking to to expand our you know frontier more, as you suggested, you know, something like a triangular uh, collaboration you know, with probably some developed countries that is possible, but also with some developing countries as well. You know, for example, we can work together with Brazil to help some African countries. You know, that is another possibility. And currently, in bilateral, uh, in bilateral policy consulting, you know, we have new kind of uh, uh, KSP. That is, we call it a you know, regional workshop of KSP. So, for example. Uh, in last August, uh, we organized one workshop in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And in Vietnam, we uh, invited the expert from the seven or eight neighboring countries, including Australia. So Korea and Australia were two advanced countries, and all the remaining uh, countries were developing countries. And we had one and a half days of workshop uh, discussing on and the export promotion policies in each country compared you know, how each country use different policies and how they are effective or not effective, what kind of problems they are having. So this is more likely multilateral rather than just bilateral. Mm -hmm. But this is not triangular exactly. But we understand that nowadays it is more and more important to have more collaboration with other countries to increase you know, effectiveness. Uh, so far, we do not have triangular approach explicitly in our portfolio, but I'm sure that uh, in the near future, we will have that kind of opportunity. Mm. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you for you. your question. Uh, as, uh, there are a couple of microphones going around, so please um, state your name and affiliation and um, state your comment or question. Marie. Hi, I'm Marie Dumont from the Korea Chair at CSIS. Um, my question was, um, sort of relating to Quaka, do they have a knowledge sharing similar thing? And if they do, do you, does KDI tend to work with them, or is all knowledge sharing programs through KDI? Thanks. You mean uh, knowledge sharing in Quaka? Well, um, knowledge sharing is kind of a general noun, as well as you know, the, it is title of the work that we are doing. So I think any organization or any institution can do knowledge sharing. And in case of Korea, uh, we have 42 organizations which are committed to ODA. And I'm sure that most of them are doing knowledge sharing. But their knowledge sharing program is not necessarily the same as KSP that we are doing. And uh, probably I am proud of myself too much. However, uh, so far the KSP by KDI is most systematic and uh, in a the very the active one in Korea. And in many developing countries when they are saying knowledge sharing of Korea, that is usually KSP. So Koika is doing some you know, knowledge sharing program as well, uh, but they are more concentrated and specialized in, in capacity building, training, and education. And sometimes they have a policy consultation. But um, as far as the economic and social development is concerned, I think the KSP by KDI has competitive advantage. Mr. Warren, in the front. 
Dr. Cha, thank you very much. I found that very interesting. I have two completely different questions. Uh, the first one relates to uh, the four tigers that you described and their four characteristics. Right. The last characteristic I was a little uh, conf I wasn't clear on, and that is the sharp fall in the fertility rate, which certainly has been the case in Korea. Right. You have one of the lowest fertility rates in the world now. But was that an institutional effort? Did the government try to discourage uh, 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 the fertility rate? And has that been a positive impact? I considered it, frankly, to be negative in the fact that it means that you're not going to have the young people in the labor force in the future. Uh, the second question, which is entirely separate, uh, is uh, given the fact that you've now developed a relationship with some 36 uh, countries, do you have a framework where you're set setting up offices or some sort of way of following up on your transfer of knowledge or cooperation? Are you beginning to put people resident or at least visiting regularly to these countries? Is it an ongoing relationship? Right. Right, um, thank you for the very interesting questions. The first one about fertility. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, the government used the systematic and institutional approach to decrease fertility. And, and at the time, we had the government slogan saying that two is enough. You know, don't deliver more than two children. You know? And I think uh, it makes sense. And, and in many demographic and economic studies, they say that at the initial stage of economic development, uh, the high rate of fertility is not very helpful for economic growth. Uh, you are right that in the long run, you know, we having you know, aging population and, and you know, the low fertility rate became a very uh, serious problem, causes very serious problem. But at least in the earlier stage of economic development, the low rate of fertility means that now parents have more time to work and they can spend more money for each of the children, you know, so they can increase human capital of each child. So because of these reasons, government advocate uh, uh, the two children policy very strongly in Korea uh, since middle 1960s. And about the late 1970s, uh, fertility, fertility rate of uh, the woman in Korea was about two. So it was almost achieved. But nowadays, we have some problem, as you pointed out, that the dependency ratio of the older people is very high. And one of the most important reason it's not because just you know the, the the family plan in the 1960s and 1970s, but the ever decreasing fertility rate from the 1990s. Nowadays, the fertility rate is only 1.2 in Korea. So this causes a big problem. But at least in the 1960s and 70s, government pursued this policy institutionally, and they achieved the two children policy very successfully. It was very helpful at the initial stage of economic development. Before you go into the second question, are you now reversing that policy? Oh, yes, yes. In, uh, uh, yeah, reverse, right? now we are saying that one is not enough. <laughs> and they try to encourage the fertility rate, but um, uh, even the policymakers now, as well as just the scholars, policymakers uh, very seriously recognize that this, this is more likely structural problem of Korea because you know, children are uh, very capital intensive goods actually. You know, if we want to raise child, we have to pay a lot of cost in Korea. So government is working really hard to decrease that the cost of raising children nowadays. And actually, it seems like to work nowadays because once it hit about 1.18, but nowadays it is moving upward like 1.24. So it's getting better, but still far lower than uh, the natural kind of a natural rate of birth to maintain the same number of population in the long run. About your second question, for KSP, well, as I told you, we use about 200 million, is it 200 million, 20 million dollars of budget every year. So that's very small amount of budget. And it's never possible for us to have uh, local offices. Uh, and uh, we understand that in knowledge sharing program, 
the modification and implementation of knowledge to local area is at least as important as creating new knowledge. So this is really a big hurdle. And to overcome this problem, uh, many times we get some help from uh, the Korean embassy in many developing countries and the cultural office and sometimes COIC office. And most of all, we employ local consultant. So when we are working together with the Cambodia, for example, uh, we have our expert team in Korea and at the same time, uh, we, have, we, we organize one local consultant group in Cambodia. So they are doing all the research in Cambodia and, and they explain the, all the situations and current status of the Cambodian economy to us. So we work together and we try to find how we modify our knowledge to the Cambodian economy. So we are trying to resolve uh, that problem uh, you know, using cost-efficient way, but uh, in the long run, probably we should uh, have mo some offices, or probably we have to have a stronger coalition with the Koika or or Kotra. Yeah. Thank you for your question. In the middle, back. Thank you for your comments. Um, my name is Alina Zhushkovsky. I'm with the Global Development Network. And uh, we are an organiz international organization that uh, supports uh, researchers in developing countries. We do capacity building. So I'm interested in your capacity building work, if you can elaborate a little bit about that and how it's different from the capacity building work that COICA does. Thank you. Right. Um, in case of COICA, well, they have a lot, well, you know, their budget is about. Uh, about 45 times larger than us, right? So it's really a huge organization, the COICA is. And, and you know, COICA has many different kinds of a capacity building as far as I understand. But in general, you know, they have some kind of general capacity building. So they have some aim, uh, like at ICT, then they invite some people for ICT training and education, sometimes for one week or 10 days, sometimes for, you know, two months or six months. And sometimes you know, they provide scholarship, so it help them to get some degree in, in graduate school in Korea. In case of a capacity building of a KSP, it is quite different from uh, Koika's capacity building program, because KSP is to try to provide a solution to our development partner countries for specific research topics. So our capacity building is concentrating on that topic. So you know we are working together with Indonesian government uh, for, for example, bond market operation. Then we are preparing the final consulting report about bond market in Indonesia. Uh, of course, that is written together with the Indonesian expert. And at the same time, we are inviting Indonesian expert who will be in charge of that bond market to Korea, probably 10 or 20 of them. And we have a capacity building program for 10 days and usually twice for one year. So this is very specific and for small number of people. So a couple of hands here. We'll go to that side, the back, and then. Yeah. Uh, Kuniko Ashizawa from outside. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, uh, I'm interested in this kind of donor coordination in terms of development assistance, and I'm, uh, I'm interested in this is the, uh, your presentation. Uh, the, the, the idea of so-called knowledge sharing program seems like a new uh, uh, the, the framework for the development cooperation. And did you receive the, some, uh, the interest from other donors to learn uh, the experience of your program, like EU or other major donor countries as well as new so-called donor countries like China or India who may be interested in uh, practicing or kind of adapting your program? Oh, well, thank you for the question because I really want to say about that, but I didn't have enough time in my presentation. Uh, that is very important. And um, actually, we are working really hard to, to share our ideas with other donor countries or donor institutions. For example, 
uh, World Bank, especially World Bank Institute, who is in charge of disseminating the knowledge, we are working very closely with World Bank Institute. And at the same time, OECD has recently initiated the Knowledge Sharing Alliance that is very similar to, well, I shouldn't say similar because they try to differentiate. You know, this kind of knowledge platform, but they are also interested in implementation as well as just having knowledge platform. And when OECD is establishing that the Knowledge Sharing Alliance, OECD invited only two institutions in the world, that is GIZ of Germany and KDI of Korea. So the OECD you know, share the major idea of knowledge sharing with Korea and working together with GIZ for implementation. So we are working very closely with World Bank Institute and OECD, and also you know, we are working with ADB and AFDB. And about the countries like uh, China or India, well, as far as I know, the Chinese government is very much interested in KSP. And about uh, several months ago, we got delegation from China, and you know, they asked us to explain what KSP is. And frankly speaking, at KDI, inside of KDI, there was some controversy, because some people said that, you know, isn't it something like uh, industrial spying, you know, if we, <laughs> if we leak our secret uh, to China, then there will be a competitor to Korea in the near future. But you know, after some discussion, we conclude that it is really healthy to have that kind of competitor. And you know, there must be some kind of division of labor because uh, Korea and China is in the different stage of economic development. And the, one of the most important reasons why Korea's KSP is so popular among developing countries is that the memory of economic development is very fresh in case of Korea. For many other developed countries, they had experience, but you know, they achieved that the economic development a long time ago, and their memory is not that fresh. And it is very difficult to modify their knowledge into, you know, for, for developing countries. But in case of Korea, most of the development occurred, took place you know, only 30 years ago or 40 years ago, and many people who were involved in that kind of development process were still alive, and they still have very fresh memory. So in you know, 10 or 20 years' time, they would pass away, right? And in China, still they are alive. So China may have fresh idea of economic development for many developing countries. And in five or 10 years' time, Korea should move up to you know, different level of economic development. So you know, in five or 10 years' time, we may use our fresh memory of uh, economic development, specifically speaking, you know, from capital intensive to knowledge intensive economy. You know, we can use this kind of thing for uh, more developed developing countries. You know, the group of developed in developing countries group. So, you know, the, I think it is really interesting to share this kind of scheme with other countries with recent development experience. And that is the way that we can contribute to the co-prosperity of the world. Do we have, um, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. So we'll take those two questions together and then. I like gent that gentleman. Yes, this both, gentleman. both questions together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Don't ask me very hard questions, <laughs> please. Actually, this is not a question, just okay. a simple comment. Uh, you mentioned, at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned about the Korea's uh, rank or ODA in, uh, compared to other OECD countries. Yeah. And as you said, Korea is still the lowest in OECD countries in terms of ODA over GNI. But yes. I think this is because of history, each country's history. I mean, yes. so that number was a typical case of past dependence. What I'm trying to say is that the other OECD countries, ODA, once Korea was just a mere colony, while other advanced countries were imperialists. So that's why our ODA is to be the lowest 
compared to other OECD countries. So from my point of view, the, the other o, uh, advanced countries, uh, ODA, is just a disguised form of uh, merchantilism or a strategy to sell their products to their once colonies. So we need other fair statistics. And we, if we use that kind of new statistics, maybe Korea is the, the, the number one in OECD countries. That, that's okay. my point. Right. Um, well, just to, to let me have some time to, to advocate myself why I told him, don't ask me very hard questions, because <laughs> actually he's my very close friend. You know? And you're in the same, same university and same club, you know, student activity club. And you know? I met him, I think, in over 10 years, 20 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. In English, different. <laughs> right, um, uh, well, you said his comment, but uh, I still would like to give some comment on your comment. Well, it is true that the Korea's ODA GNI rate is the lowest among you know, dark member countries, and it is never good to have that kind of figure. However, uh, I do not agree to you when you're saying that you know there is some kind of mercantilist view uh, for some you know ODA donor countries. It may be right, but in ODA studies they saying that there are four you know different kinds of purpose of ODA. The number one is humanitarian, and number two is colony management, and number three is economic cooperation, and number four is security reason. And you know the mercantilist may be you know related with some of this, but it cannot explain in the ODA based on humanitarian incentive or you know, security reasons. But anyway, in case of Korea, uh, well, it, it is very low, and I think it is very natural because Korea joined DAC in November 2009, so only three years ago. And it is not rational or reasonable to ask that kind of country to meet up, you know, 03 percent or 0.4 percent of GNI as other developed countries are doing at the moment. So Korea already promised to increase its ODA GNI ratio to 0.25 percent or 0.25 percent in 2015. So that is very ambitious already. But Korea is working hard to meet that goal, you know, step by step. The one of the most important reason why Korea's figure is low, together with you know, late joining in DAC, is that uh, because it always has very strong demand for you know government budget in many different sides, like you know, North Korea, the defense budget always explain about 15 or 20 percent of you know Korea's budget, and education and, and economy investment, and nowadays social welfare demand for social welfare. But even among you know this kind of budget pressure, still Korea is working really hard to increase its ODA GNI ratio, and you know, it is still one of the lowest. However, the country's effort to increase its ODA GNI ratio must be acknowledged by many countries. Great. I think we have one last hand in the middle. Um, my name is. Chuyong Park. I work for the World Bank in corporate finance and risk management. I'm hearing today two pieces of good news about Korea's popularity in the world. One this morning was Chai's uh, the, the the dancing with Madonna, and then the other one is this. And I feel like I should say I work. For the, for, for the KDI for a few years, many years ago. So I, I'm very proud of uh, uh, today's presentation, particularly uh, KDI's role in, in KSP. Now, um, while you were in college in the early 1980s, I worked for the KDI, and then that time it was very controversial, ex ante, to set Korea's strategic growth plan, particularly in comparison with you know, those four tigers, the Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, compared to those countries, Korea took 
heavy and chemical industry, uh, uh, industry oriented plan and export promotion. And then Taiwan took a different approach, uh, import substitution uh, uh, growth plan. And there, there was a, a huge debate about, the, about the, the future success that time. It was about ending of Korea's third uh, economic and social development, five-year development plan. So my question is on the substance. You know, particularly uh, comparing against those uh, remaining three countries, what is uh, uh, KSP's selling point at the nation's strategic growth plan level? That means what has been the source of uh, economic and social development or growth in Korea. So probably KDI is, is government organization and uh, probably work with <coughs> other uh, governments uh, or government uh, institutions for the economic plan at the nation's level. So what is a, uh, what is a selling point? Thank you. By the way, thank you for inspirational information today. Very. Thank you. I think we have um, just a few minutes. So just. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, um, Mr. Park started with a very warm word, but the question is very harsh. <laughs> so. <laughs> right. Um, well, among the four tigers in East Asia, I think Hong Kong is quite different, you know, because it is it was you know colonized by UK and yeah, the UK economic system was transplanted is you know lots of fair and its window over the large continent. So it was really easy for that uh, city to grow as open economy. So it is quite different. And Singapore, very successful story, however. Uh, the size is very small, and you know geographical uh, advantage was very important for Singapore to be a cosmopolitan city. And in that sense, Korea and Taiwan may be comparable. Uh, and well, it is not the, it is not the ending whether the Taiwanese uh, growth model based on SME or uh, Korea's uh, you know growth model based on HCI, which one is you know more effective? It is not ending yet. Uh, but what I want to say here is that at least in two aspects, the initial condition of Korea was worse than Taiwan, but Korea achieved almost the same level of economic growth as Taiwan. I think they might be appealing. Uh, the, these two you know, the different things, the first one is the productivity of the agricultural sector. The Korea and the Taiwan, both of them were agrarian countries when they started economic growth. But in case of Korea, uh, the whole whole country was mountainous. About 70% was mountains, and the land was not very fertile, and agricultural productivity was very low. So this is you know inferior to Taiwan. And second one is the level of initial human capital. In case of Taiwan, you know they had a large number of highly educated people who were retreated from mainland of China to Taiwan. But in case of Korea, only a few Koreans were educated in the higher level uh, during the Japanese colonization. So, you know, Korea could achieve economic growth, you know, at, and, uh, in spite of this kind of two disadvantages, I think that is very important part. Um, well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Cha, for your wonderful presentation and for being here. I know you're traveling to many different parts of the world. Thank you for choosing to be in Washington, D.C. Um, so let's give a round of applause to Dr. Cha. <laughs> and thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you found it informative. And if you have any questions, we have a few moments um, to stick around afterwards. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you.